Hey, what's up, Republic Commando fans? It's Josh Adams. Thanks, as always, for joining me here on the channel. So Hard Contact is behind us. We've got it in the can. We hope you guys enjoyed that ride as much as we did, and we're deep into the trenches on triple zero right now. So as many of you guys know, we don't own the rights to the Republic Commando novels by Karen Travis, nor do we own the rights to the audiobook that we're producing. It's a fan project, a passion project. It's something we felt like needed to be done, and we're happy to do it, not only with these two books, but also with the other three books that we have coming up after these. So the pandemic has given me a little bit of free time at home away from the studio, and I've tried to use it productively to finish up my own personal novel, The Queen's Blade. And here's where I need all of your help. The Kickstarter for The Queen's Blade novel is launching today. If you head over to the link in the description below, you'll be able to read all about it, see the cool tier rewards and the stretch goals, but the audiobook in particular is going to be produced by Dark Hills Entertainment, read by myself. So you're going to have all the great voiceover work, sound effects, all the things you've become accustomed to with the Republic Commando novel so far, and an original score for the audiobook written by composer Ian Michael Elmore. To prove that, stay tuned after this video, and I've included two sample chapters of the audiobook with the high production value that you guys are used to for you to check out. Again, the Kickstarter's got tons of cool tier reward programs and stretch goals. Uh, again, head over to the link in the description below, check it out. The Kickstarter is going to run from February 19th to April 11th, so you'll have 45 days to head over there and help us out in any way that you can to bring the Queen's Blade to life. Lastly, I want to thank you guys so much for making the last year and a half working on Republic Commando such a ridiculously fun experience from your comments, to your likes, to your loves of the video, just the sheer fact that we have 1,300 subscribers for something that we did entirely organically is, I, I don't even have the words, but right now is where I need your guys' help to bring one of my projects to life. So again, head over to the link below in the description, do anything you can. I promise when I wrote The Queen's Blade, I had fans like you guys in mind the whole time. Thanks again for being here, and we'll see you again on the next episode of Triple Zero. Dark Hills Entertainment proudly presents the audiobook version of The Queen's Blade, written and read for you by Josh Adams. Prologue. Terrace Ka opened his eyes. The darkness had crept up on him. When he had begun to meditate, it had been early afternoon. His knees felt cramped and his lower back was screaming with stiffness now that he had begun to come to. His mind wandered far from his body during his meditations. He lost all connection with his physical senses and the reawakening period afterwards was always excruciating, like being born again. In his corporeal form, he lived lifetimes within minutes and forgot the simple nuances of pain, weakness, heat, and cold. But he felt the damp, cool air upon his face now, his bare feet wet with dew from the evening mist settling in like a blanket of fog and shadow surrounding him. He had not felt the sun in many hours. He glanced to the sky above where the moon sat low and full. It illuminated the wispy fog with a soft bluish glow as it descended upon the garden. Hello, my old friend, he said in a soft, raspy voice. He was surprised to hear how weak and dry he sounded. Each meditation took a larger toll than the last, it would seem, and he felt hunger and thirst rise within him. A prickly tingling of sensation returned to his extremities, and his thoughts turned to his surroundings. He looked to the moon again and smiled. His smile turned to a wince as he moved to rise. The stone body of the great keep, the thousand-year-old castle belonging to all the lands of the Maul, surrounded him, casting shadows through the hazy azure fog. A compendium of all the world's knowledge of the art of warfare, guile, and death but it was far more than that he knew. 
The complete history and collective knowledge of all the lands within the mall were kept here, and he, its sole occupant and caretaker. He rose to his feet, his old bones cracking with every inch. He brushed the grass and dew from the knees of his purple robes and stood hunched with his hands upon his knees for a moment, allowing the stiffness to recede. He fought to control the pain, feeling tendons stretching and muscles groaning from hours of misuse. He was no longer young, he told himself. For two centuries, he had remained its guardian and the last resident of the great halls of the library, and those years had taken their toll. The library had been constructed with a massive circular garden comprising of almost every species of flora the mall had to offer. Ornate fountains carved in glitter stone and trimmed with silver and gold linsteel dotted the landscape, flanked on all sides by wildflowers landscaped into place by large rack stones from the heart of the great mountain itself. Rough, hewn blocks of glitter stone paved intricate paths throughout the garden, connecting all of the great halls. Birds fluttered about within the large trees that provided portions of the garden with shade during the day, all enclosed within a great stone wall with carved marble archways and broad turkwood doors leading to each of the halls. From the center structure, the library's five connected halls extended out thousands of feet like a massive five-pointed stone star, each point concluding in parapet towers rising high into the midnight blue. Each hall contained the knowledge of the five races of the mall. The Shadow Hall, home of the Raku, the great stealth assassins, men from the Rock Mountains, draped in shadow cloaks and silent as a river cat. The Forge Hall, once the residence of the Denishari warriors of the great grass plains of Lintz, masters of the forge with their perfectly crafted linsteel weapons, stout armor, and their great horns of war. The Flame Hall, dwelling place of the Eldur priests who lived in the underground city of Nam Tenju, wielding the great and powerful magic of fire. The Tide Hall, resting place of the knowledge of the Durhai Sea Hunters, magnificent archers, and seafaring folk from the Trident Isles. And lastly, the Hall of War, a place populated by the thunderous and strong Lusitari, the most powerful of the five races. Each with the strength of ten men, the Lusitari had mostly left the mainland of the Maul and retreated to their island stronghold in the sprawling frigid Northlands. Long ago, each of the five races had sent emissaries to the Plains of Lentz in order to hold a council of war that would bring all the lands of the Maul together against a common foe, an enemy from far across the Eastern Sea. The battle had raged for the better part of ten years on these same plains, and the men of the Maul were triumphant. The invaders were killed to the last man. The library was constructed to honor that fellowship, built centrally among all the five lands of the Maul, not only a place of great knowledge, but also a practical workspace for the most inventive and imaginative minds in the five lands. Siege engineers, inventors, Alchemists, weapons masters, healers, and armorers called the library home. They crafted the most deadly war machines and most potent forms of healing under the same roof and shared the knowledge within its great stone walls. Millions of books and scrolls, maps and sketches, histories and fictions lined the great halls. Artisans, sculptors, and craftsmen flourished within the library's walls as well. Gargantuan canvas paintings by long-forgotten artists littered the long halls of the library, whilst glitterstone sculptures depicting the many heroes of the Great War stood sentry outside the rooms that extended off of each of the halls where heroic men of war, science, art, and magic chased their individual pursuits. But that was long ago, he reminded himself. The glitterstone guards remained but the halls and rooms stood empty. The heroes themselves were no more. In the days before the peace, each of these towers would have supported battalions of men and women from each of the five lands to defend the library and its treasures. Great dining halls, kitchens, barracks, armories, war rooms, and private quarters fit for any Lord General that may have been stationed there with all of the amenities of any fort or castle now stood empty. 
Dust had gathered whilst the battlements sat abandoned for the last 500 years, and now instead of soldiers, battalions of field mice and sparrows manned these walls, battling decades on end with cockroaches and moths. The forest and swamps surrounding the library had kept many would-be explorers at bay over the centuries. Tales of demon wraiths and dragon wolves had filled the bedtime stories of the children in the surrounding areas, and that had gone a long way in deterring any of the average citizens from venturing in. But Terrace Ka knew that on occasion throughout the years, one brave warrior or another sought to learn if the Great Keep was real. With tales of great treasure and vast knowledge, it was an alluring prospect for any person that sought glory and riches. He also knew the forest floor was littered with the bones of those that had tried. The land itself was no longer traversable by horse or carriage, and those on foot became prey to the beasts that unknowingly guarded the ancient walls of the library. Any maps of the land had long ago disappeared from the realms of men. No one dared enter that forest. The villages and towns that once bordered the forbidden lands moved further and further away, as the people distanced themselves from the area that would no longer support them, and eventually the keep itself fell into legend, and over time, forgotten completely. He was alone, and would remain that way. For now. As a Shokai, he was aptly suited for the role of guardian. Certain males within the Shokai clan were blessed with unnaturally long life, and immunity to most natural ailments and injuries. His father wept the day that they had found out that his son had been blessed, or cursed as his father saw it, when Terrace had cut his hand upon a harvesting blade and the wound closed almost instantly with no sign of a scar and no blood let from the wound. The priests of Eldor had arrived the next day to take him into their fold to be trained in the healing arts and to learn to serve at the Great Keep. After years of rigorous training and a selection process, he was chosen from a group of three other boys that shared the gifts of the Shokai and was stationed at the library during its final years. Few remained at the keep even then. Some stewards from the individual lands and their serving folk, a single contingent of Lusitari warriors led by a female captain, and a few starving artisans with nowhere else to go. Over time, the remaining residents of the keep left or died, and within time only the walls of the library and the moon above remained to keep him company. He had stalked the halls as a younger man, tended to his duties as guardian, slept, ate, and started the whole cycle anew day after day. Daily routine turned to redundancy, and he found himself bitter and sad for a time before coming to the realization, after almost sixty years of solitude, that no one else was coming. They have forgotten about me. Forgotten about this place he told himself aloud one day, as he sat down to his morning porridge. Later that day, lost deep in his thoughts, he walked the tide hall during his morning rounds. A raven flew from one of the many open doors along the hall and startled Tereska, causing him to stumble backwards and lose his footing. He landed hard against a glitterstone statue of Mardis the Spearman, the first king and guardian of the Trident Isles where the Durhai made their home. The weapon that Marta's statue carried was not made of glitterstone, however, and Terrace had to pry himself off of the linsteel trident that had pierced through his right shoulder. To his astonishment, the wound would not heal. He staunched it and treated himself according to the healer's books in the shield hall. He made a poultice after two days to stop the infection from spreading, but he was too late to stop the fever. He burned and raved mad with it for six days, alone fearing death, but on the seventh morning his fever broke. He sat that evening with his shoulder and arm in a cloth sling, looking out upon the dark forest as the sun set, and there he remained, stunned and confused, until it rose again the next day. I must do something, he muttered to himself. He was no longer healing the way he had as a younger man. The blood of the Shokai didn't mean immortality. He had been taught that. He would simply live longer than any natural man, and his wounds would heal quickly. But the blood of the Shokai was waning in him. If he stayed, 
then he would die here, forgotten and alone. The people would forget about the keep and its contributions to the world. He must find someone, remind them that he was there, waiting. He had decided to leave that morning. He packed his travel bag, crammed bread and salted mutton into a knapsack, donned his sword belt and cloak, and set out from the tower exit of the shield hall and off across the courtyard to the forest beyond. He was determined not to die alone, and for the first time in decades, he felt alive again. There was hope beyond the forest. Towns, villages, and people that needed to know he was still here, and he stepped into the woodline confident and full of hope. A hope that lasted only a few hours. The dragon wolves had made short work of him. With their long reptilian snouts and razor-sharp serrated teeth, the beasts descended on him in a pack. Black as night they were, darting left and right to surround him as they came into a clearing where he had made his campfire the first evening. They lunged at him again and again, and with his sword arm still bandaged and in a sling, he was left at a disadvantage protecting himself. Their leader, an old gray beast with mangy locks of ragged hair draped across his vast reptilian head, paced the outer circle of the pack and watched as he used fire and steel to ward off one attack after another. When the gray beast had rounded the pack, it came up behind him while the man was occupied with its mates. Its large pointed ears leaned back and it leapt, sinking its teeth into his wounded shoulder, taking him to the ground, the momentum of the attack forcing the sword from his hand. The mouth of the beast was rank, with days old prey still lodged in its teeth and the smell of swamp and marsh. He screamed in pain as the gray beast jerked its head back and forth and crept out of the circle to claim its prize. A younger male swept in to take his legs and clamped down on his right knee. With his free hand, he unsheathed his dagger and drove it down into the soft meat between the younger male's shoulder blades. It released its grip and howled in pain, whimpering and retreating to the rear of the pack. The others, driven by hunger and bloodlust, seeing the weaker, injured wolf as a target, pounced on it, voraciously tearing at its throat and stomach. Terrace reached with his free hand to the head of the gray beast as it dragged him away, desperately clinging for purchase, and then found it. He sank his thumbs into the beast's eye, and it jerked in pain, yet it retained its grip, clamping down harder, dragging him slowly in the dark. As a last desperate attempt, he pulled his wounded arm free of the sling and reached over his shoulder, pain tearing through him, and drove every finger he could fit through into the beast's remaining good eye. It released its hold, snarling and snapping blindly in the dark. He rose to his feet, fear and panic, driving him to run. He left his travel pack and sprinted in the direction that he came, stumbling in the dark and falling hard a time or two, tripping over roots and fallen trees. He ran until his throat and lungs burned and his legs became numb. Before long, he could no longer hear the snarls of the dragon wolves and he slowed to a stop to catch his breath. He walked for another hour before making it to the clearing outside of the shield hall. Once inside, he treated his wounds, applied the poultice to his shoulder and leg to fight off any infections again, and wrapped his torn flesh tightly. The fever returned to him, but nowhere near as bad as before, and after three days, he was walking again. He recalled limping lonely through the halls, weeping over his inevitable death and abandonment, his despair, amplified by his wounded body. He remembered the first scroll he had pulled from the walls in the forge hall. Out of loneliness and boredom, while waiting for his wounds to heal, he turned to the comfort of the stories within the halls of the library, and had not stopped. He read of the great beginning, when the wise king mated with his warrior queen, and created all the lands including them all, about how Mother Night protected the Rack Mountains with her cloaked embrace. He read of the Forge Lords that created the first sword and gave it to man. He learned of the visitors from the sky that arrived before the city of Nam Tenju was born, passing the skills of healing and fire onto the Eldur. He read tales of the heroes of old, perused every map of the realms, analyzed blueprints for weapons and machines, 
explored armories, and made himself proficient in every weapon known to the five lands. He began practicing the forgotten magics through the writings of the Eldur and the Durhai, both of which had mastered certain aspects of the elements, most specifically fire, and anything that is or once was organic. He mastered the forge with help from the knowledge recorded by the master smiths of Old Lentz and the weapons masters of the Lusitari, and became as adept at manipulating the shadows as any within the Raku clans. Months became years, years turned to decades, and before long he was noticing his hair graying as he passed the reflective shields that adorned the halls within the keep. His bones and joints had begun to ache, and he could feel the sting of old wounds now more than ever before. Before he knew it, he had absorbed the knowledge of the old world, and with it, the realization that he was growing old. That was fifty years ago, and it was long past time to put that knowledge to use. He looked to the moon again. My only companion he whispered, smiling. He limped to his walking stick, still leaning on the fountain where he had left it earlier in the day. Yes, he had been one of the Shokai, masters of time and age, but now that time was running out, and he had traded his skills in combat for a cane many years ago. His plans were coming to fruition, but he needed to act soon. He left the damp and cold of the garden, and hobbled into the shadows just outside of the broad Turkwood door that led to the warrior's hall. He turned and took one last look at the moon, full and bright in the sky above. A primal, blood-curdling scream erupted from the Brand Hall and echoed throughout the entire keep, shattering the serene silence that had surrounded the garden. Well, he said, Maybe not my only companion. He turned into the hall, and with a motion of his hand, the great wooden door swung closed behind him. Chapter 2 A good thief is a silent thief, the big man yelled as he slammed the boy on the table. He pulled his whalebone-handled knife and held it to the boy's throat. But you, boy, you can't seem to keep your mouth shut. Artemis Cole sat in the back corner of the maiden's legs, the filthy hole in the wall that passed for an inn in the town of Darkholm, thanking the gods that he didn't have a conscience this late in the afternoon. His piercing gray eyes had watched the big man, whom he knew as Dirk, toss the young boy around from one side of the tavern to another over some poorly planned heist that the boy supposedly spoiled with some sneezing. Word around the inn had been that Durg and his men had barely escaped a retinue of Lusitari mercenaries hired by a dark home merchant to guard a shipment of leathers carried by wagon from Lucian and bound for Darkholm to be sold. Durg, the self-proclaimed master of thieves, had taken a group of hungry highwaymen to attempt a smash and grab on the eastern side of the Silk River Bridge, but Durg had not counted on the Lusitari Sentinel soldiers that guarded the caravan and immediately decided to call off the raid. The boy, called Spit, had given away their position via sneeze at the exact moment that Durg changed his mind, but by then the Lusitari had found them out. Despite Durg's protestations to the contrary, the Lusitari judged them to be ambush thieves and began to deal with them as Lusitari do all thieves, which was to chase them down through the upper Emerald River wood and beat most of the others to within an inch of their lives. Only Dirk, Spit, and a few others escaped to make their way back to Darkholm, and judging from the noise level and tension in the maiden's legs, Dirk was not happy about it. Bloody sneezing every time I turn around! I can't wipe me own arse without you bloody sneezing about it. He dug the knife into the side of the boy's nose. Wonder if you can sneeze without a nose. Blood began to pour down the boy's cheek, and for the first time during the whole beating, the boy began to whimper. Dumb, 
Artemis thought. So much for my lack of conscience. He rose from his seat, and one of the highwaymen stepped in front of him to bar his path. Artemis stopped for a second and looked down at the man's hands resting on his black leather vest. Not your business, lad. Off with you. The man snarled through yellow teeth. Artemis grabbed the man's arm and twisted it around his back and slammed his head into the gray petrified slab of turkwood that made up the bar, shattering the man's teeth and nose. He yanked the man's dagger from its sheath and he hauled the thug's head backwards with a handful of greasy hair and slammed him bodily on the floor. He had sent the dagger flying before the second highwayman could take a step towards him and it caught him square in the throat. The man dropped to his knees, gurgling blood and pawing at the handle of the dagger clumsily. The behemoth, the third and last man between Artemis and Dirk, lifted a heavy mace and swung wide in an attempt to make Artemis short by a head. The mace hit one of the vertical beams that supported the upper floor of the maiden's legs and came to a dead stop, lodged in the wood just inches from its target. Wrong tool for the job, mate. Artemis smirked as he jabbed out his right hand, extending his fingers and caught the brute in the meat of the throat. The towering thug stumbled backwards, clutching at his throat and fumbling about, unable to catch his breath. Artemis thrust his foot forward with all of his weight and momentum, catching the highwayman full in the chest and sent him flying backwards, toppling two other patrons near the door. Dirk rose from his position over the boy. Do I know you? Dirk said as he began to round the table towards Artemis. Do you have any idea who I am, you filthy little? Before Dirk could finish his sentence, Artemis reached out and grasped the handle of the mace and thrust it forward, catching Dirk on the bridge of the nose with the heavy linsteel shaft. He let the massive weapon fall to the floor, and it landed on Dirk's foot, crushing the flesh and breaking the bones inside his red leather boot. Blood gushed from his nose, and his eyes watered to tears as he fell back into a chair, moaning in pain. No, Artemis replied. I don't. He turned to the boy still lying prostrate on the table. Come on, lad, he said, helping the boy to his feet and leading him towards the door. It's time we were away. Outside, large flakes of snow had begun to fall, and the two tread noisily through the banks of snow along the edge of the main road through Darkholm. My conscience has left me hungry and cold yet again, Artemis thought. He looked down at the boy who was wiping the blood and tears from his face with the ragged edge of his cloak. So, uh, why do they call you Spit Boy? He asked. Me paw used to sell Greenleaf and Larkspur when I was born. Greenleaf, Artemis had heard, was a flavored chewing leaf in the mainland used by farmers, tradesmen, and common men alike, and was known for the slimy green spit that its consumers expelled whilst chewing it. And on account of me being so small and scrawny and not very smart, me paw used to say that his green leaf spit was worth more than I was. The name just stuck, I guess. Artemis chuckled. <laughs> well, I've had worse names. They trudged on through the snow towards the edge of town. Darkholm had a small contingent of Lusitari troops stationed there to keep the peace, and by now they would have been sent to the inn to investigate. Artemis hoped that the good fortune of catching three known felons and their ringleader would keep them busy enough to not inquire about him or the boy. He looked down at his scrawny and unkempt young companion. No older than 13 years, the boy must have had a hard life to be alone this far north of the mainland where he claimed to be from. His oversized ragged cloak bore the tattered remains of a collar of squirrel fur, and his cloth tunic and breeches were doing little to fight off the cold of Darkholm. The wounds on the boy's face would need tending to, and he needed proper clothes, and from the look of him, he was surely half-starved. Have you any family here in Darkholm? Artemis asked, knowing the answer before it came. No, me lord, the boy replied. I came up with me father during the summer two years back, but he died our first winter up here on the road to Lucian. Dirk and his bunch found me begging in flake and took me in. Thank the gods for small favors, Artemis thought to himself. He had heard this story too many times. 
poor men from the mainland came looking for work as mercenaries in Lucian, dragging wives and children with them. The men would be killed in some far-off land that had hired Lusitari sentinels for any number of nefarious or noble reasons, and the families were left behind to survive on a widow's income, or in some cases, nothing at all. This boy's case was only slightly different in that his father hadn't even made it that far, and the boy had been left with nothing, trapped in a land he was unfamiliar with. Street leeches like Durg would often swoop in on impressionable types like Spit and promise riches and rewards for joining up with his gang. Pickpockets and sneak thieves is what they turned out to be mostly, and Durg and his lot rarely ever showed initiative for anything more than a few silvers the younger boys were capable of rounding up in a week's time. Durg and his lieutenants would take the lion's share and leave the boys with the scraps that remained. It was in no way an honest living, but when faced with compromising your morals or going hungry, it was easy to see how boys like Spit could make the choice. And your mother? Artemis asked. Died of the pox when I was still a baby, Spit replied. And no mother either. The boy's life became more tragic with every step they took down the snow-covered street. What do you mean to do with me, me lord? Spit asked, stomping in the snow. His posture told Artemis that he wasn't used to strangers asking so many questions of him and was wary of continuing until he knew where he was going. First off, we're going to get you some decent clothes and fill your belly. Then, we're going to get your wounds looked at. Artemis paused for a second. And lastly, I'm no lord. He turned and continued on through the snow. They reached the edge of town, and Artemis turned left to follow the outskirts road, the wide stone-paved outer road that encircled the whole of Darkholm. After several hundred paces, he came to a gray stone building with a long, blackened chimney rising from the rooftop above. A wooden sign hung from the chains above the door bearing two hammers crossed over an anvil, the mark of a blacksmith. Artemis rapped lightly three times on the door, and after a few seconds, footsteps could be heard crossing the thick wooden planks of the building's floor. The door opened, and a large, barrel-chested man stood full in the doorway. He had a thick, bushy black beard, streaked with salty gray from ear to ear, and his thick mustache carried the yellow tint of someone who enjoyed the pipe. He wore a heavy leather apron across his midsection and thick rawhide leather boots with soles thick as planks. His hair was long and wiry and pulled back into a tail and tied with a strip of leather. Have you any silvers, kind sir? Silvers for the poor? Artemis asked mockingly. You'd sooner have the toe of me boot in your arse than coin from my purse, you scoundrel. The large man grumbled in a low and menacing voice. The two eyed each other venomously for a moment, before bursting into laughter, and Artemis could tell at once that Spit was relieved. Artemis and the big man locked forearms, then embraced one another, the large man's arms practically swallowing Artemis. The embrace ended, and the great bear of a man gripped Artemis about the shoulders. It's good to see you, lad, he bellowed. Artemis turned to Spit. Spit, this is Ogre. Ogre, this is Spit. He leaned into the lad and whispered, Told you I had heard worse names. He stood upright again and winked at Spit. Ogre welcomed them into the large front room of the building. Adorned with a large oak wood table and chairs, the room looked much larger inside than the building that held it. A roaring fire burned in the massive stone hearth and Spit wasted no time seating himself next to it and removing his cloak. How did you come by the boy? Ogre asked gruffly, his best attempt at a whisper. He was on the wrong side of a knife when I met him, Artemis replied. I couldn't watch him get hurt. You always did have a soft spot for the little frogs, Ogre said, as he pulled out a wooden seat and plopped down in it. The chair creaked under his massive weight. Of course, that's probably easy to do when you used to be one of them, eh? Something like that, Artemis replied. I hate to trouble you, but do you have any food? 
The boy hasn't eaten, and I thought perhaps Loris could look at his wounds. Loris? Ogre bellowed. What? Came the shrill answer from the back room. Bring bread, meat, and ale, and your sewing kit. Ogre replied over his shoulder. There's bellies need filling and wounds that need tending. Just like old times, Artemis smirked. Ogre rolled his eyes. A portly middle-aged woman with large brown eyes, cropped white hair, and a soiled dress apron came striding into the room, and Artemis rose to greet her. Artie! She shouted and squeezed him about the middle. She pulled away in feigned self-consciousness, brushing at the front of her apron and tidying her hair. If I would have known you were coming, I would have made myself decent. She said, taking stock of the room and its occupants, then finally turning to Ogre. Did you say someone's wounded? Artemis looked to the boy by the hearth, and Loris followed his eyes, then covered her mouth in surprise. Oh my! She gasped. What's happened to this boy? She said as she hurried Spit away from the fire and into the light of the window where she could have a better look at him. Darg and his men, Artemis replied. Nasty bunch, the whole lot of them, Ogre added. Loris placed her hand on the boy's cheeks. We're going to fix you up straight away. You must be starving, sweet boy. Come, sit down and Loris will make it all better. She pulled out a wooden chair from the table and thrust the boy down into it. 